mountains thrust forth from the molten darkness of the earth, mountain and valley, the virgin west, high plateau and red rock of sandstone, wilderness west, prairie land rolling on and on to the end of sight, oh, pioneer west. What fervent dreams lay half buried in this land of promise? Dreams crushed by a cruel nature or the lance of an Indian warrior. Every page in history must have its beginning. And ours takes us to the year 1867. An army that had fought in the war between the states that had bravely battled in many an Indian campaign now patrolled the West in a time of peace with ever-present thoughts of home. The Indian was back on the reservation, where the Peace Commission of 1867 had met with various warlike tribes and secured certain promises from them. In return, papers were given the Indians, certifying them to be good citizens who would obey the laws of the land. Many gifts were distributed. Beads. Pieces of cloth, ammunition, and war surplus rifles. Naturally, these rifles were quite unfamiliar to the Indians. And of course, it was understood these weapons were to be used solely for the purpose of hunting game. The leaves turned early in that year. It could be a long, hard winter. The signs were everywhere. In the high country, the morning frost would sometimes last until afternoon. Buffalo were feeding ravenously. Beaver were damming and storing with strange vigor. Horses and dogs were becoming shaggy-haired as never before. And it could be sensed in the booming, bustling mining town of Denver. Most historians agree that the events leading to the Battle of Whiskey Hills and the subsequent disaster at Quicksand Bottoms began here in Denver at a miners' meeting. Such meetings were frequent and held usually as part of the political fabric of the town. But the meeting of November 4th had a marked air of grim foreboding. Quiet, I got an announcement I got to make. Quiet, I got an announcement I got to make. In 10 days from now, the city of Denver will be bone dry. No! Not one drop of whiskey anywhere. What do you think? We can't hear you. I said the city of Denver will be bone dry in 10 days. Heard what I said. I said, plumb out, and I mean out. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought Bert Keeler was getting in a big order, but he was down sick with the ague, and he thought Sam Buford was getting in 60 barrels, but Sam got his foot caught in that bear trap, and he didn't tell Shelby to go ahead with his 50 barrels, so... So with four big orders out of reach, there ain't nobody else put in. Now, take this here soon alone. That's all there is. Look at it, and keep in mind there's already been snow flurries along Gunners Pass, and if we get ourselves a hard-cold winter, there won't be a wagon load of whiskey in Denver till next spring. And it could be a late spring. No, no, no. So what we need, we need us a plan. Hey, what does Oracle say? Oracle, what about this here winter? The uh, buffalo are feeding ravenous. The beaver are working something fierce. Horses and dogs are growing shaggy-haired like never before. What else? Have you seen anything else? 
Yep, uh, had me vision and, uh, oh, come on me two days ago. Well, what was it? What'd uh, you see? Uh, oh. All right, thank you. At the feed store, it was. I come on more sudden than most. I was looking up, and uh, there it was. What was it? Snow. Heavy, white snow. Yep, it's going to be a long, hard winter. And when a long, hard winter hits us, by damn, she hits. No wagons getting through, no supplies? And no whiskey. You know. Yep. Come on me two days ago. We got to have a plan. Yeah. What kind of plan, Oracle? Uh, now, let me just... Uh, oh, thank you. Now I see it. I see all of us are coming together. I um, I see us uh, putting all the whiskey orders into one big shipment for the whole winter. I see us getting an ironclad guarantee from uh, from some good company like uh, 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 thank you, like uh, Frank Wallingham. To get them drinkables to our saloons right now afore the snow's hit. I, uh, I see a wagon train, a whole wagon train loaded up with whiskey uh, coming down on us from Julesburg. I see 20, uh, 30, 40 wagons. Are you Hobbs? I am, sir. That. I did, sir. And who may I ask of you? Frank Wallingham. See, si. how do you do? Won't you sit down, Mr. Wallingham? No, I want to know why. Why did you do it? I've done nothing but print the truth. A matter of 600 barrels of Philadelphia brewed whiskey moving from here to Denver. Yes. And then what happens when the Indians get wind of 40 wagons full of fire water, huh? They'll scalp us from head to foot. Indians don't read newspapers. Who says they don't? The Indian problem's all settled, Mr. Wallingham. Haven't you read the report of the Peace Commissioners? All right, then, worse than Indians. Revenue agents. Oh, haven't paid your federal taxes, huh? Of course I pay my taxes. I'm an honest businessman and a good Republican. But you'll give those snoopers one taste, honey, and they'll come swarming down on you from every direction but up. And they're working on that. You have my sympathy. Sympathy? <laughs> That's because I wouldn't advertise in your filthy rag, because I wouldn't let you blackmail me into giving you free whiskey. Better get out of here. Now, you listen to me. I've got every cent that I own tied up in this cargo. And by damn, I'm going to see it gets to Denver personally. You can print that, sir. I shall. And I'm also sending a telegram to Colonel Gerhardt at Fort Russell. I am demanding an entire troop of United States cavalry as escort. Print that, sir. I shall. Good. Well, you shall also put in your paper that I say that any tax snooper, white road agent, or red Indian that tries to come near my wagons had better be wearing his cast iron underwear. And if you try to blackmail me one more time, I'll come back here and I'll cram this down your lion throat. Good day, sir. Smythe. Yes, sir. What's the name of the, that temperance woman? Martindale? Massingale, sir. Cora Templeton Massingale. Oh, yes, Massingale. Do you know where she is? On a tour of New England last month, sir. Then from Boston to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to Trenton, I think. She may be a female hellcat about whiskey, sir, but a fine figure of a woman with eyes... That's right. Mm, sir. I asked you where she is. Oh, at uh, Fort Russell, sir. She got there yesterday. Fort Russell? Send a telegram to her. Mark it urgent. The editor of the Julesburg Gazette is quite right. Indians did not read newspapers. It's a matter of speculation, therefore, just how they did hear of the whiskey cargo. There were couriers, of course. And there was the smoke signal, first used by the ancient Greeks and Hebrews. How the Indians acquired it from them is of no importance here, but they did. Nor was smoke used exclusively. A crude mirror, painted stone, carved bark of trees were quite popular and a peculiarly knotted string the message was always transmitted in code 
a code which no white man was ever able to break. Regardless of what method was used by the Indians, it's a matter of record that news of the whiskey train became common knowledge within 48 hours to every tribe of every North American Plains Indian. We are still quite unaware why only one tribe rode out to investigate the train of fire water. But it's to be supposed there was some competition among the various tribes for the honor. It is for us to make reconnaissance of wagon train position. It is for me to make such reconnaissance. He is chief of Sioux. And I am chief of Crow. We will do it. You will not do it. I will do it. You and I are blocked. Yes, we are. Authorities agree that personal disputes among the Plains tribes were settled very quickly. Just south of Cheyenne stood Fort Russell, famous throughout the West as a bastion of military strength and the home of the rugged, disciplined frontier soldier. Stand up, stand up and sing it, beat it on the drum. Stand up, stand up and sing it, down with demon drums. Stand up, stand up and sing it, raise your banners high. Victory is coming, victory is mine. Be leaders, victory is mine. I give you once again, Mrs. Cora Templeton Massengale. Oh, thank you, thank you. Your reception has warmed my heart. Ladies, you have heard it said that, that man is all mouth and muscle, that he is, is dirty boots on one end and a dirty mind on the other. Well, don't you believe it. If we are to enjoy equal rights with man, then we must respect him. And if we are to respect him, then we must save him from himself and from the poison of alcoholic spirits. Do you agree? Yes! Then let the world know it. Let us spread the word of emancipation to every corner of this great nation. Emancipation! Let me hear it! Emancipation! Freedom for women! Freedom for women! Shout it out, ladies! Women can remake the world! Women can remake the world! Sergeant? I hate to say it, Colonel, but it sounds like Sue were shy on war cries to me, sir. An uprising at the fort? Ridiculous. Yes, sir. I can read his life the
Skirmish line to the left. Cannon, sir. Form a skirmish line to the left. Form a skirmish line to the left. Oh. In the beauty of the very skies, this morning across the sea, with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. Oh, carbines, ho! Oh. Company Barry, turning open the gate. You. Good evening, Colonel. Bandmaster, front and center. You're under arrest. This entire band is under arrest. You're confined to quarters until further notice. Dismissed. Now, who are the idiots who fired those cannons? Sergeant Perkins. Private McIntosh. Private Johnson. Private Graham. You'll report to my quarters tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Yes, sir. Ready. Return carbine. In file, prepare to dismount. Dismount. Madam, Article 12, Section 7, Paragraph 2, Army Regulation specifically states, government property cannot be used for political demonstrations. Sir, we have never designated our movement to be political. Article 9, Section 2, Paragraph 4 of Army Regulations clearly states that civilian meetings may be held at military installations when permission has been granted by the commanding officer. The commanding officer? I see. You'll forgive me, madam. We've been on patrol for six days. I'm somewhat weary. You say Captain Slater gave you permission in my absence? He did. Brady, I want this best cleaned up immediately. Yes, sir. Ladies, I see you have transport. You'll be escorted back to town. The party will leave in five minutes exactly. Do I assume, madam, you have quarters here this evening? I have. Then you may retire to those quarters, madam, and remake the world on some other occasion. Good evening. You. Sir. You'll get me Captain Slater. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Did the colonel wish to see me? Where the hell did you come from? I couldn't help but overhear, sir. And I want the colonel to know that what happened tonight, the way it happened, happened so quickly that I hardly had time to marshal my forces. Did you or did you not give that woman permission for her temperance rally? Yes and no. Uh, that is, I had no idea it would get out of hand, so to speak, sir. What the hell did you expect? You have a woman in Acorn, next thing you know, you're up to your rump in oak trees. <laughs> That's very true, sir. And I am sorry. If only they hadn't started moving, that is to say, marching. Led by the Fort Russell Band. No, I'd say that Mrs. Massengale led them and the band came next. You see, they were playing the uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. And every time they got to Hallelujah, boom. Well, I'm sorry, sir, about the men who fired the cannons. Spare me the details. Slater, don't you realize what would happen if word got out that Fort Russell stood squarely behind a temperance movement? That I, a line officer, could ever support such a movement? Well, you got a point there, sir. And you let them go right ahead. Well, I, uh... Actually, I was trying to keep the colonel's daughter out of it, for your sake. 
My daughter? What's my daughter got to do with this? Well, your daughter... Please. I beg you not to hold Paul responsible, Louise. Father. It was my fault. I was the one who... She was not. And I refused to allow her to accept responsibility for this. I was the one you who... You were not? In my own quarters. We are sorry, Father. Truly we are. But... But what? But... But may I point out, sir, that you have the only private quarters at the fort. And we didn't expect you back so soon. And whereas it's true that Miss Gerhardt does have her own quarters, sir, I thought that my presence there might put the Colonel's daughter in a, in a compromising position, so to speak. And, and since my own quarters are shared, sir, but your quarters... Slater, yes, sir. answer me. I'm trying to, sir. He isn't either, not truthfully. He wasn't keeping me out of the temperance meeting here. I was keeping him. I thought he might try to stop the marching, so this seemed to me a lovely... I mean, a way to divert him. Louise. You don't really mind, do you, darling? I mean, you certainly couldn't have enjoyed yourself any the less. Louise. Uh, well, I'd do anything for Cora Massengale and her cause. And if you've hurt her, Father, I'll never forgive you. Slater. Yes, sir. The women, the rally, the cannon. Chalk it all up to your inexperience. Thank you, sir. But you cannot. You simply cannot use my quarters for, for this sort of thing. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Why don't you just get on with it? Marry the girl. Stop all this, this lying around. Well, the Colonel knows my feelings about that, sir. The West is no life for a woman. The West is no life for anyone. Wind, dust, Indians. I hate the wind. I hate the dust. And I hate the Indians. Yes, I know. And until my transfer comes through to an Eastern post, I'll... I'll drink to that. To you and Louise and a transfer. There you are. I can't, sir. Why not? Well, I haven't said goodnight to Louise as yet. The uh, liquor on my breath. She knows you drink. She knows I drink. I know that, sir. But if you could have seen her at that meeting tonight, she heard Mrs. Massengale. Her eyes all lit up. Frightened hell out of me, sir. All right, all right. Go to it. Do, do whatever it is you do. That's it. Thank you, sir. But not on my bear rug. Not anymore. No, no, sir. Slater. Here. Escort for a wagon train. A fellow named Wallingham. Taxpayer, good Republican. I want you to figure out how to intercept the train and escort them to Denver. Denver? But that'll take over a week, I promised Louise. I know, I know. She'll cry, of course. Just tell her duty is a cruel master. Yes, sir. Duty is a cruel master. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. I don't wish to intrude on your privacy, Colonel, but this is vitally important. I'm taking a bath. Well, the sight of a gentleman taking his bath is not foreign to a woman who's been widowed twice. Well, uh, would you care to have a seat? No, thank you. What I have to say is best said standing. You'll forgive me if I don't get up. It's not necessary. Mrs. Massingale, I've already told Captain Slater I won't hold him responsible due to his inexperience. And in your case, I've written off the entire incident. So now... But that's not why I'm here. I have just received a telegram from Julesburg that distresses me deeply. It says that a train of 40 wagons left there yesterday bound for Denver and that you are going to furnish military escort for that train. Is that information correct? I received a request to that effect, yes. Are you aware, Colonel? that the cargo of those 40 wagons is alcohol. No, ma'am. Well, now you know. Tell me, Colonel, are you going to furnish escort? Yes, ma'am. Oh, 
I respectfully request that you reconsider, Colonel. In the name of suffering humanity, I implore you to halt that wagon train and, and destroy this, this poison that they're carrying. What you ask is... What you ask is impossible. The cargo is legal. And I have no grounds, no wish to destroy civilian property. And now, madam, will you leave me to my bath? Is it legal to sell whiskey to Indians? Who said, it, who said anything about Indians? Cargo is headed for Denver and consigned to businessmen there. How do you know? I have the owner's word for it. For Mr. Frank Wallingham, who happens to be an acquaintance, a taxpayer, and a good Republican. Well, in that case, you force me to take action. Our movement has many friends in many high places. Men such as Horace Greeley. Is that a threat? You can consider it such if you like. My conscience forces me to make it. And mine demands that I do my duty. So be it. May I impose upon your kindness for directions to the Post Telegraph Office? Mrs. Massingale, I'll do better than that. I shall be happy to furnish you transportation to the Cheyenne Telegraph Office, where your messages are sure to get out twice as quickly. Thank you. And call on me again if there's anything further I can do. You're a very generous man, Colonel. Sir, just arrived. Read them. The governor of Colorado is against liquor and its vicissitudes, but his position makes it impossible to take a position in a matter of whiskey cargo to Denver. Ah. The adjutant general's office is ever grateful to women's temperance for the splendid morale factor they have upon the American soldier. However, the disposition of whiskey matters must be left to commanders in the field. Respectfully. Mr. Horace Greeley has ever championed the noble cause of temperance and suffrage, but is unable to interfere with constituted authority of the West. Ah. Buell. Yes, sir. Give these to Mrs. Massingale with my compliments and arrange transportation for her. Her movement is moving. Yes, sir. On the morning of November 16th, the Wallingham wagon train was moving along north of the South Platte River. At the head was its owner, Frank Wallingham, and its wagon master, Rafe Pike. To the rear was a group of Irish teamsters under the leadership of one Kevin O'Flaherty. The Slater patrol was turning south towards the course of the Wallingham train and a band of Sioux warriors was on the move, led by the great chief Five Barrels, and his sub-chief, Walks Stooped Over, who was also known in certain Indian circles as Sky Eyes. Due to the blue color of his eyes, the heritage apparently of some slight uh, um, irregularity in his ancestry. Please, Father, be reasonable. No. Mrs. Massingale wishes to have a farewell meeting. She's welcome to use the mess hall. But under no circumstances will I attend. But we're not asking you to take the pledge, Colonel. Although a bit of temperance might make you happier. No red-blooded drinking man is more temperate than I am. And I'm happy. I'm damned happy. If you would only try to understand, Mrs. Massengale, a woman who's lost two husbands to alcohol, they literally drank themselves into an early grave. I can only wonder why. Do you absolutely refuse, Father, to attend this meeting? I not only refuse, but I'm beginning to regret giving you the hall. Then the very least you can do is release the post band. No. But we can't sing any hymns without the band. Good. Then there's no point in having the meeting. Splendid. Please, Father. It means so much to us. And Mrs. Massengale is leaving. We may never see her again. Can I depend on that? Oh, I never go back on my word. I shall say goodbye at the meeting. 
Maybe the trombone. Oh, thank you, Father. You're a dear. And the drums? No, no drums. Good afternoon. What's going on over there? Singing, sir. You have guards at every exit? Those were your orders, sir. Well, you better double the guards. Check the exits yourself. If they ever break out of that hall in marching formation, that's just what happened to Captain Slater. Yes, sir. Ladies, our enemy has two heads. First, the enslavement of women by men. And second, the enslavement of men themselves by the remorseless tyrant alcohol. Are we willing to fight these enemies? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then we must reach out for freedom and tear this tyrant from the lips of man. And now, ladies, I have an announcement to make to each and every one of you who has touched my heart. The time has come for me to say goodbye to all you wonderful women. Thank God. Something has occurred which requires my presence elsewhere. I am going to the city of Denver. Denver? I know, I know. You ask me why Denver. I'll tell you why. Because 40 wagons of whiskey are going to Denver right at this moment. 40 wagons of poison for those poor, misguided citizens. And no one in high office seems to care. Well, I do. And I shall shout it over and over until the very mountains of Colorado come tumbling down to the Denver saloons. Yeah. Will your hearts go with me? Yeah. Is our cause just and righteous? Yes. Yeah. I've doubled the guards at every door, sir. I want you personally to guard the main entrance. Wait a minute. Do I have your blessings? Yes. Yeah. No. No. I cannot let you go to that sinful city alone. If you'll have me, Mrs. I'll go with you. Get over there. Drag my daughter off that platform. Oh, how wonderful, ladies. Oh, ladies, we'll all go to Denver. Yeah. We'll make it our marching song. Yeah. <laughs> said, sir? I did. But, sir? But, sir, what? How can I let them go through with it, sir? Uh, march to Denver through country like this, without escort, without protection? What if they come up on a bunch of bloodthirsty Indians, sir? I, uh... I suggest we pray for the Indians. Uh, can the, uh, the army refuse escort, sir? From now on, the army will do what I tell it to do. What do you intend to do, sir?
Morning, Mr. Gerhardt. Good morning, Sergeant Beale. Under any circumstances, go off with that that woman. Yes, Father. To Denver or any place else. I want that clearly understood, Louise. Yes, Father. Now, will you please leave me alone? Is he better? I'm afraid not. Louise, I want you to go and get me some more blankets. Lots of them. I want him to perspire. We will sweat the poison out of his system. Blankets. All right, Mrs. Manson. Mrs. Massingale. Lie back. Madam, Mrs. Back. Now, just quiet, please. Don't exert yourself. Madam, we have a surgeon. Just relax. Let the blood flow. Now, tell me, Colonel. The pain center lie about here. Look, Miss... Well, it's a little higher. A little higher. Yes, of course. About this march, Mrs. Massingale. Just unwind. This march to Denver. Impossible. Right here. At this junction, Colonel, a series of cords. And beneath them, intertwined nerves like fine silk threads. Matters of, of transportation. Rattlesnakes. All connected up to here, where the pain center lies. Examine my position. Consider, if you will. Oh, that feels good. That's the key point. First, we rub gently downwards, and then upwards, and then downwards again. Now you're beginning to relax. I can feel it in my fingers. I wish I could help you, but army regulations. Article 12, section 26, paragraph. That's right. <sighs> Relax. Relax. Covenant, attention. Good morning, Father. Good morning, ladies. Yeah. Mom. Who are those men at the gate? Uh, just a few husbands, sir. Not all the ladies are single. What do they want here? Well, the ladies are taking their wagons away. They're 
kind of worked up about it. I uh, want the colonel to do something about it, sir. Sir. Well, does the colonel intend uh, I mean to say, sir, will the escort party... Sir, do you really intend to go through with this thing? Buell, you've got a great deal to learn about military science. Sir? A simple matter here of objective and stratagem. Objective? Get rid of these damn women. Stratagem? Take them to Denver, sir. Mount up, Buell. Mount up. Yes, sir. Move them out, Brady. Yes, sir. Just one bugle that joins in with that singing, I'll have him shot. Listen! It might be prudent right at this moment to get our bearings upon this historic arena. Julesburg is here. To the southwest along the South Platte River is the city of Denver. North of it, we find Fort Russell. The Wallingham wagon train had moved to this point on the river. The first cavalry patrol under Captain Slater, here. The second cavalry patrol under Colonel Gerhardt, here. With, of course, the temperance marchers. And the band of Sioux Indians, here. In the city of Denver, another miners' meeting was being held. Someone just tell me who called this meeting, what for, and what's all the hollering about. I did. Clayton, we got to face the facts. There's been no word from that wagon train in two weeks. That's right. There's snow on the ground already at Grizzly Pass. trouble. You know. That wagon train may not ever get here. Well, why not? Oh, why, thank you. <laughs> it was all set on coming to me. I, uh, I was looking up and, uh, uh thank you. Fire! Now, see. What? Uh, engines. I see hundreds of engines. Anything else, Oracle? I think uh, I'll see mine. 
Let's see, men on the march. Cavalry? Of course not. This ain't no time for children. I see men, men carrying uh, picks and uh, axes and uh, 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 shovels. Well, who are they? Denver Citizens Militia are marching out there to intercept that wagon train and see that whiskey gets home. Hold on, Uncle. We're working men. We're miners. We ain't engine fighters. And I ain't gonna go off marching up in the river, sleeping on the rock or cooking on campfires. You gonna spend the whole winter in Denver without no whiskey? At dawn, the morning of November 17th, the second cavalry patrol was heading due south for Denver with, of course, the temperance marchers. The Wallingham wagon train was turning west. The first cavalry patrol was moving fast to intercept it. The Denver citizens militia was making an easterly crossing of the South Platte River while the Sioux Indians were coming down from the north picking up more braves all the time. Oh, oh. oh, beloved love of all the saints, and Pat and Mike and Bridget, and all the souls in purgatory, not again. You call yourself a wagon, you rotted wheel collection of wood, you ain't fit for carrying swill to vultures. What's your excuse this time, you ignorant immigrant lump? Oh, lump, is it? Uh, well, all things being equal, we'll be having a ward with your lordship. I told you I am not a lordship. Can't expect an Irish surf to forget the habits of a lifetime now, can you? Just get on with it. Well, now, we, the Irish Teamsters, have a petition of grievances. We state in plain and simple terms the bad conditions under which we've been forced to labor. And I hereby raise formal objection to the following. To wit, travel hours in harnessing, unharnessing, caring for horses, loading, unloading, bedding, guard duty, poor drinking water, order of wagons in March, and might I add in addition to, no whiskey ration whatsoever in a whole cargo of whiskey. And now suppose these grievances of yours aren't answered. What do you do? Strike? Oh, that's a very ugly word to a working man, sir. But it would be considered. Ah, well, in that case, O'Flaherty, you strike. Strike. And who might I ask, pray tell me? Are you going to get to drive your sweating, rotten wagons? Hear your grievances? We struck off 12 more copies, exploiter, capitalist. Ah. Hey, my now, profiteer. <laughs> I presume. That's right. Captain Slater at your service. Colonel Gerhardt sends his compliments and asks me to tell you that he's most happy to comply with your request for escort to Denver. Ah, good for Colonel Gerhardt. Now tell me, have you seen any Indians scouting for me? It's the Wallingham. There aren't any Indians within a hundred miles of here. Haven't you heard of the Peace Commission? With a cargo like this, you've got to be sure, damn sure. Indians, revenue agents, temperance women. Oh, you know. Know what? How about Cora Massengale? Where? What? It's all right. She, she's not here. Cora Massengale is at Fort Russell giving temperance lectures. Are you positive she's at Fort Russell? I can 
positively guaranteed. Uh, she isn't any nearer your cargo than, than the Indians are. Hot. <laughs> Wait till we get you in. Sergeant, I, uh... We've got a morale problem, sir. Take care of it, Buell. I think the colonel will have to root it out, sir. Right at the core. The ladies, sir, are taking baths. In the nude. Mrs. Massingale, I'd like a word with you. some other time, Colonel. I'm taking a bath. I am well aware that you are taking a bath. I don't care how dirty you are. I will not have you ladies bathing in the nude. There's no other way I know of, Colonel. The opportunity presented itself, and who knows what tomorrow might bring, especially now that we've changed our plans. Changed your plans? Yes, Colonel. You mean you... you want to go back to Cheyenne now? Oh, don't be ridiculous. Of course not. We want only to meet the wagon train. But you are meeting the train. That's why we're going to Denver. But we want to meet it long before it reaches Denver. Oh, that's not possible. On the contrary, we now intend to intercept the Wallingham wagon train along the River Platte. You what? In a clash of wills, Colonel, he who shouts loudest is lost. Madam... Madam, if I understand you correctly, you are planning to lead your ladies through unsettled plains country along the South Platte River Trail, is that correct? Exactly. And upon meeting the wagon train, I surmise you plan to put on some sort of demonstration whose purpose is to turn back the train. Precisely. Very well. But if you think the United States Army is going to escort a bunch of harebrained females across open desert, bent on throwing themselves under horse teams, you're gravely mistaken. Very well. I thank you for your many courtesies thus far. But if you force us to go our way unescorted and any harm comes to us, three million infuriated women will turn the War Department upside down. Mrs. Massingale, if I could force you to do anything, which obviously I cannot, it would be to go home and stay home where all decent women belong. Sergeant. Sir. Damn it. Yes, sir. Sergeant, I want you to put some scouts on the trail of those women tomorrow. Have them keep in constant touch with this command. We'll move in a somewhat parallel direction. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, parallel direction. Is that a new tactic, sir? I'm not acquainted with it. It was well known throughout the war. Yes, sir. Of course. What's it called, sir? Called? I mean, uh, what command shall I give the men? Uh, move in a somewhat parallel direction? It's called detached contact. 
attached contact. And let it so be recorded in the Daily Journal. Yes, sir. documents can establish just how the Sioux formulated their plans, although it's known that a plan was so formulated. All we can do is surmise what was said. A sheet to a charge, what can she here? White man win war. Now we use white man's way. You, Chief, walk stooped over. With 20 braves, attack front of wagon train and draw off guard. You, Chief Elks Runner, with 20 braves, attack rear of wagon train and draw off guard. All other braves attack center of wagon train. When long knives chase braves, then great chief five barrels and two brothers-in-law circle around whole wagon train, come in from southeast, grab last three wagons and go like hell west. In the morning, when the sun rises over Iron Mountain, Two hands high. Attack. If long knives capture braves, show them paper. We good Indians. No trouble. Go back to reservation. But before you go, don't forget to ask for presents. In preparation for their attack, the Indians took up three positions. Here. Here, and here. The Wallingham wagon train was moving in this direction, escorted by the 1st Cavalry Patrol. The Temperance Marchers, having turned east, were moving in this direction. The 2nd Cavalry Patrol under Colonel Gerhardt was maintaining detached contact. The Citizens' Militia were now heading due north at this position, obviously a collision course for all concerned. The day began with a sandstorm of disturbing proportions.
We've got a shelter from this dust.
Due to the poor visibility, we are only able to approximate the positions. As the battle neared its climax, we believe the wagon train was here. The two elements of the 1st Cavalry Detachment here and here. The 2nd Cavalry Detachment here. The Women's Temperance Marchers here. The Denver Citizens Militia approximately here. The Indians here. Here and here. Here. It is not known what happened to the striking Irish. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, then, these are the final positions in the engagement that became known to history as the Battle of Whiskey Hills, but which, of course, was as nothing compared to the subsequent disaster at Quicksand Bottoms. <laughs>
That's a miracle. I beg your pardon, sir? A miracle of the highest order that so many bullets could have missed so many people in so small an area in such a short space of time. No fatalities at all? None reported, sir. Now, what does the Colonel propose that we do now? Well, our duty is crystal clear. The first thing we must do is keep the peace. You agree, Buell? Absolutely, sir. Now, there are three important steps to peace negotiations. No fraternization and no discharge of firearms. Yes, sir. And the uh, third step, sir? The third step? Uh, it's not important. What is important is we must have a conference. You can't have peace without a conference, Slater. Buell. Sir. Inform all interested parties. A conference will be held here in one hour from now. Yes, sir. Now, beyond that, my contract, I got it right here, my contract says that I am going to deliver, and by God, I am going to deliver come hell or high water. So now, first thing you got to do is get them damn foreigners out of here. Mr. Wallingham. Now, I am a taxpayer, sir, and a good Republican, which means I am entitled to Army escort, and I'm damn well going to get Army escort. I'm going to raise all kinds of hell between here and Mr. Washington. Mr. Wallingham. What? I will not tolerate profanity in the presence of ladies. Oh. I think we understand your position by now. Now, the next part that you'll be heard from will be, uh, uh, who are you? My name is Clayton Howe, sir, commander of the Denver Free Militia. And what do you want? Well, I'd like to inform the colonel that a lot of us here are members of the Denver Saloon Owners Association. And we intend to receive that there cargo and take it home with us. Now, the winter nights are long and lonely in Denver, sir, and a man is sorely in need of comfort. Starting next month, that there sun's going to be accepted at 5.33 p.m. And she's going to rise 11 dark hours later. All right, all right. I think we're going to leave the sun out of this. What are you doing here, Oracle? Uh, sir, uh, Colonel, uh, I'm the guide to the Denver Free Militia. It is my duty to see that this precious cargo and these good people... Thank you. With... Thank you, Oracle. I'm well aware of the duties of a guide. You're next. Kevin O'Flaherty at your service, sir. President of the Irish Teamsters. With your lordship's permission, I have here a resolution containing 14 points, which I would like to read as preliminary to these labor negotiations. Labor negotiations? If our demands are not satisfied, your lordship, we intend to strike, as nasty as that may seem. By damn you, just well, strike! Well, what? Oh. I am not going to abandon ten of my wagons to them Indians. Well, who said you have to? You've got the whole uh, Denver Free Militia to drive your wagon. What? Oh, uh, excuse me, sir. The militia couldn't drive the wagon, sir, unless we took a soldier to guard each one of them. They're the worst barflies in Denver. Yeah, for that matter, uh, who's going to guard the soldiers? Yes, I see what you mean. Our supply of temperance men is extremely limited. Yes, sir, it sure is. Well, then, <clears throat> since you have nothing further to say, Mr. O'Flaherty, Colonel, sit down. I now call on Mrs. Massingale. Thank you very much, Colonel. The temperance movement has now spread across the length and breadth of this great nation. Our noble movement, founded in the year... Mrs. Massingale. We are not here for a history of the movement. Have you anything further to say? I have. Dump it, I say. Dump this entire vile cargo into the river right now. It's By it's damn, madam, you touch one of my barrels, what? Here, come. Did you get that, Captain? Not a word. But I have an interpreter standing by. Sims! Yes, sir. Sims, find out what they're doing here. Why they left the reservation. Yes, sir. Hunt buffalo, minding own business. Then white long knives come along and attack peaceful Indians. Papers say peaceful Indian. We go home, but first you give us presents. What did he say? He said, um, hunt buffalo in peace. Minding their own business when white long knives attack. What? Yes, sir. But they're willing to go home now, sir. Oh, that's fine. Tell him he's made a wise decision. Yes, sir. Where are presents for us? 
You give me 20 wagons, whiskey, or I don't take my braves home. Period. Yes? What'd he say? He, he said uh, he would like to give you a present, sir. Well, that's fine. But he hasn't got one, sir. Oh, I understand. Thank him, but tell him no present is necessary. Yes, Wait, sir. I'll tell him. All right, then. Tomorrow morning, this whole, uh, this, uh, we're leaving for Denver. You will take your orders from Sergeant Major Buell as to starting time, disposition of marching order, campsites, etc. Any decisions to be made will be made by me. Sergeant? Conference sends adjourned. following us. Matter of fact, sir, I was going to bring that matter up to the Colonel's attention, sir. Uh, they've been trailing us along all day, sir. Shall I uh, take a squad and run them off? Sir. Jewel, well, don't you know the Indian wars are over? These civil wars are the government, and we represent the government. How the hell do you think that would look in Washington? The Colonel has a point, sir. Get the interpreter. Find out why they're still here. Yes, sir. And Buell. Sir. We'll camp early tonight. The quarters assembly. Have the sentries out before dark. Yes, sir. Potter. Sir. Check the rest of the sentries and find Sergeant Buell. Yes, sir. Gale, sir. She has use of another tub, sir, and she thought the colonel looked dirty, sir. Kind of scroungy and mucky, sir. And she thought she sort of... Yes, sir. Colonel Gerhardt, sir. Yes? All sentries on their posts, sir. The Denver militia is retired for the evening. Where's Sergeant Buell? Well, he's still at the Indian camp, sir, with the interpreter. That's all, Carter. Yes, sir. Sir. Come in, Buell. Report from the interpreter, sir. The, uh... Well? Uh, there might be just a little confusion, sir. Confusion? Uh, confusion, yes, sir. Uh, the interpreter was only sure they said hunt buffalo in peace, uh, minding own business when white long knives attack, uh, willing to go home. Would like to give you a present. Sergeant? Get me Oracle Jones. Yes, sir. Friend. Yeah. Go ahead, tell me. Don't 
beat around the bush. Find out just why the hell they're still here. The chief says he's waiting for the presents. Presents? The widow. Oh. Well, tell him we don't want any presents. And thank him. Ne iada io iocha ia. Yeah, on congressni. Dakawashni. Not for you, Colonel. For him. Just a minute. He said, hunt buffalo in peace. Minding own business. Sim. Yes, sir. You're under arrest. Yes, sir. Suppose I refuse to give them any presents. They won't go home. Well, we'll find out what they want. E Transka. The chief says he wants uh, 20 wagons of uh, Miniwaka uh, crazy water. 20 wagons of whiskey? That chief, uh, he's a real boozer, Colonel. Well, you tell him no. No one's going to blackmail the United States Army. No, sir. Tell him to pack up his braves and get back where they come from. I'll tell him. White chief, Indian chief, meet as friend. Leave as friend. No crazy water, no whiskey. Go home in peace, but go home. Sergeant. Sir. <laughs> Damn, I was sick. Sun down, you had your wagons in towards quicksand bottoms. What for? We'll be camping there tonight. No, we ain't. Not this train. Oh, sure, Frank. Well, you just suit yourself. That's a waste of time and horsepower. I'll just slide out to Denver on the lonesome. Mm. Wait a minute, Oracle. You seen something? Well, now, I don't mind telling you things is just beginning to come through. What? What? Can't say. Got something to do with quicksand bottoms, has it? Yep. Rafe? Rafe! 
We get the quicksand bottom, you head in. We're going to camp there tonight. Huh? Yeah. I said when we get the quicksand bottom, head in. We're going to camp there tonight. Okay, Frank. They've taken ten of Wallingham's wagons and formed a circle. Oh, where's Wallingham? Well, he's getting the militia together, sir. He's also threatened to use force, so I've taken a platoon and put them between the militia and the ladies. The ladies? What have they got to do with this? Well, they're supporting the strike, sir. What? It's quite possible that violence is imminent. <laughs> Come there, you alien radical capitalist anarchist! Hold your positions, ladies. Ah, well, you finally got here, did you? All right, I want you to get this damn mess straightened out. Just what are you and your ladies up to this time? Merely exercising our right to peaceful assembly, as guaranteed by the Constitution, a document which you, as an army officer, are sworn to uphold. O'Flaherty. We're just good, honest workmen, your lordship, exercising our God-given right to refuse to work. Ha! You're a pack of cowards, that's what you are, hiding behind the skirts of these women here. Besides that, you're a thief. You're a pack of Irish thieves. They stole ten of my wagons. I demand you do something about it. Now, calm yourself, Mr. Wallingham. I can see your wagons. They don't look stolen to me. Well, they're as good as stolen by them. I must remind you again, sir, there are ladies present. They're damn right they're present, and I want them removed. I'm sorry, Mr. Wallingham, but this is obviously a labor dispute. And much as I hate to admit it, Mrs. Massingale and Mr. O'Flaherty are within their rights. Rights? What about my rights as a taxpayer and a good Republican? I shall protect your wagons and your cargo. But under army regulations, I cannot... All right, men, we've had enough of this tin soldier lawyer talk. Get in there and club down them Irishmen. Club them down and tote them women out. Slater, take charge. You will meet force with force, to whatever extent is necessary. Companies A and B, move up. Ho! Draw a carbine. Ho! Uh, come on, get in there. What are you waiting for? Uh, be reasonable, Frank. We can't fight the United States Army. It wouldn't look good. <laughs> All right, Gerhardt. I'm holding you personally responsible for every one of my wagons. I accept the responsibility. You. Sir! We'll camp here tonight. Pick a site. Yes, sir. Field order 138, sir. Yes, sir. My congratulations, Mrs. Massingale. A brilliant maneuver, flawlessly executed. Thank you, Colonel. I'm very flattered. Maintain order, Slater. Massingale, ma'am. Would you mind telling me just what you expect to gain by all this? Time, for one thing. Ah, but you can't keep my wagons immobilized forever. We'll see. Would you mind telling me what your next move might be? 
Well, apart from our non-violent picket line, we have no plans. Except to have our meeting at the Indian camp tonight. A what? A rally. A rally, Frank. Hold your positions, ladies. Come along, Louise. A rally at the Indian camp. We will play. We will play. We will play. The Say. He says, uh, good to sign White Squaw's paper. Good for peace. thing I ever do. I'll have that entire van transferred to Alaska. What are they doing now? They're singing, sir. And signing pledges. I don't believe you. As far as I can tell, they got over 50 of them signed already. Well, you go back there, Sergeant. Get me one of those pledges. I want to see it. How can I get one, sir? Yes, sir. Mark, but each one of them is marked different. That one. How many? 81 now, sir. 81. Get back there, everyone. Yes, sir. And tell Slater to be sure his flanks are coming. Yes, sir. Chisel? That Massengale woman, what happened to her? Oh, she down there, Summers Frank, uh, taking advantage, ignorant savages. There ought to be law again. Be something. Oh, what? But there ought to be something. I don't trust her. Oh, you just keep your pants hitched, Frank. Chief says, no more peace. What is it, Sergeant? What happened, Sergeant? The Indians have captured the women. What? Well, it was sudden, sir. Uh, one minute they were all signing pledges, and then... Oh, did that idiot Slater ever let it happen? Well, on behalf of Captain Slater, sir, I think it's only fair to state that if the women hadn't started singing hymns and making all that racket... Sir, the Indians disarmed my men and took the ladies captive. I know what they did, Slater. Yes, sir, and they moved so fast, and we were so outnumbered. There was nothing I could do. Sergeant, put! Right the bugler. Rouse the camp. Mount the troops. Prepare for battle. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, any rash move on our part may seriously endanger the lives of the women. Damn it, man, I can't just stand here and twiddle my thumbs. No, sir. Sir, the sergeant's right, sir. An attack right now might be most ill-advised. Sir. What's he doing here? He's a symbol of their good faith. Good faith? They want to bargain with us. Bargain? 20 wagons of whiskey in exchange for the women. 20 wagons? 
Yes, sir. See, the Indians... Can you understand this? Not a word, sir. Twenty wagons comes out to about... three and seven-eighths women per wagon. At least I think that was their demand. Now, maybe the interpreter was a little confused. Slater. up. Yes, sir. There's only one course of action now. And that would be, sir. I'm declaring martial law. I say you can't do it. No tin horn colonel's gonna come out here out of his own territory and declare martial law. If you don't shut up, Mr. Wallingham, my first step will be to lock you up. Gentlemen, this kind of bickering can lead us to nothing constructive. Since you cannot or will not take military action against the Indians, and since you cannot or will not negotiate with them, there is only one course of action open to us. We must accede to their demands and give them the whiskey without further delay. Giving whiskey to Indians is strictly forbidden by the army regulation so dear to your heart, Mrs. Massingale. Not if the Indians don't drink the whiskey. What's going to stop Indians from drinking whiskey? Precisely. I have their pledges. One hundred signed pledges, with this one on the top, signed by Chief Five Barrels himself. That's his mark. She's right, that's his mark. Well, do they get the whiskey? That's not his whiskey, it's mine, and you're not going to touch one drop of it here. Listen, Quiet. Right. In that case, I have no choice but to destroy all the whiskey right now. <laughs> you're bluffing. Oh. Am I? There is a woman hidden in each and every one of those wagons, awaiting my order by code to start smashing the barrels of this vile cargo. Madam, you lie. Indeed. Ladies of Group B! Frank, with you, kid, the pants hate. The signal was to be a hymn when I started singing, but that's not necessary. Now I'll just tell them to begin. You wouldn't do that. Ladies of Group B, you may begin. Puncture those barrels. No, wait. Just a moment, ladies. You let her smash a barrel. One barrel, and I'll have those brass buttons ripped off your chest in the very halls of Congress. Now, I'm a taxpayer and a good Republican. You'll say that one more time, Mr. Wallingham, and I'll bust you right in the nose. You threaten me. Now, sit down. That? Sit down! Now, come on, Frank. Sit down! And shut up! Mrs. Massingale, sit down. Sit down! And stay down. Ladies of Group B, get out of those wagons, right now. Sergeant, put this down. Yes, sir. The United States Army hereby confiscates 20 wagons of the Wallingham train. Ah, there, you said it. You hear that? Confiscation of private property, in which case I shall be repaid in full for my loss. Go ahead, declare martial law. Said martial law to take effect at daybreak. You'll declare martial law right now. Don't you tell me when to declare martial law. Slater. Yes, sir. Take that symbol of good faith back to Chief Five Barrel. And Slater, knock down the price. You? Sir? Meeting stands adjourned. Get out of here. Go on, get out of here, you bunch of vandals. Get off of my property. Get, get off of my bed. Get, get out of here. I thought I heard you, Frank. <laughs> you 
got me into this, you suit saying sot? Well, now get you out of it, Frank. In fact, it's all set. Everything's ready except one more chore I gotta do right now. Believe me, Frank, you just trust old Oracle. Me and my Billy Girl is gonna fix it all up. <laughs> Come on now, Billy Girl. Take me slow and take me true. you're up to, but whatever it is, I don't want to hear about it. I've just come to tell you how truly sorry I am for what I've done. Thank you, and good night. Colonel, do you realize what will happen when word gets out that you've given 20 wagons of whiskey to 100 Sioux Indians? I realize. 20 wagons confiscated from a man who's a taxpayer and a good Republican. Don't you tell me what he is or I'll, I'll bust you in the nose. Dear Colonel, those cords again, just let me... Get away from my cords. Would you just... Relax and let the blood flow. Through. My blood can flow on its own. Now, Mrs. Massingale, I don't know what your plans are for tomorrow, but judging from experience, you better get some rest. How can I rest after what I've done to you? Try! Selfishness, my obstinacy, my stupidity in not listening to your excellent advice. Well, I must agree with you there. It's all my fault you're in this terrible position. Well, crying isn't going to help. <laughs> Mrs. Massingale. You needn't look so shocked. Plato, Augustus, Alexander, even George Washington took occasional spirits and medicinal amounts. There's nothing wrong with limited libation under emotional stress. Your entire career is ruined. Well, I, I suppose there'll be some criticism. Criticism, you'll be crucified. The press, the public, the War Department. Horace Greeley. Oh. Well, if I can save the lives of 27 women, I, I'd gladly sacrifice my career. After all, what is it? Only 19 years of service with Grant at Vicksburg, with Thomas at Nashville. 17 Indian campaigns, Laramie to Fort Hall. One more year. $281.25 a month. Pension. Sergeant Buell, $27.50 a month. Every month. 19 years. And all that time, not once have I ever, never have I ever met anyone like me. Like me? Oh, well, I'll, I'll just resign gracefully. Anyway, I'll resign. Well, at least you still have your beloved West. I hate the West. Oh, dear. West wind Indians. My stubbornness, my obstinacy, my selfishness. Now, now, Cora, uh, uh, Mrs. Massingale. If only I'd listen to you. If only. Easy, 
Easy, Mrs. Massingale. Cora? Do you think you can ever forgive me, Thaddeus? Well, I... Come here, Slater. Captain Slater reporting, sir. Stand up. We'll march to Denver. No more wine. Someone singing. Go on, Slater. <laughs> uh, Chief Five Barrels said he'd take 15 barrels. I came back with eight, and he said 13. At least I think that was the number. Language barrier is very difficult. Did you reach any agreement? Yes, sir. Ten wagons of whiskey. Ten wagons? For all the women. Well, good work, Slater. Thank you, sir. What's he doing here? Same reason as before, sir. He's a symbol of their good faith. Are you sure he can't understand us? Not a word. That's all, Slater. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, the Indians would like to have <clears throat> um, Mrs. Massengale present for the exchange, sir. What for? Our symbol of good faith. Tell Chief Five Barrels I'd be happy to join my brave ladies. Yes, ma'am. I'll make all the arrangements for the exchange, sir. Good night, Slater. It's scheduled for dawn. Isn't it wonderful? Ten wagons. That's the exact number held by the Irish Teamsters. You're not going to have to confiscate any of Mr. Wallingham's wagons after all. Yes, uh, well, <clears throat> it's a long day tomorrow, Cora, and you need rest. I'll take you back to your camp. Oh. Oh, I can get back by myself. You're sure? Oh, that is. You're so kind and Generous and brave. Good night, that is. Stand up. We'll march to Denver. No more wine or beer. Stand up. We'll march to Denver. We shall see. We shall see. We shall save us. Hallelujah. Quiet. Quiet. Huh? Frank, she's all fixed up. What? Hey, Frank, listen carefully now. This is important. Frank. Hey, Frank. You've been drinking. <laughs> Frank, listen carefully. If you could get your wagon train out of here, if you could cross the river right here so as nobody, no engines or women or army could follow you, would you do it? Mm -hmm. How? Now, now wait I... a minute. You'd have to give up them ten wagons on the exchange. Right. Now, now, here's what we do. We take all the rest of the wagons, and we go right across Quicksand Bottoms. All right. None of them people could see us. Hold it. We get right across the river, right here. Hold on! Right. We go... Just sit down right now. Nobody can cross Quicksand Bottoms, because it's We can. Right? Raise the way. Ah! Uh. Right. I found it five years ago. A bunch of scalp-hungry engines chased me right up to the edge. Well, sir, I knew for sure they'd get me that night if I didn't get across. I just pinted my billy girl south and let her go. She didn't miss a step. I did the same thing tonight. She took me right across. I've staked out a trail right across the bottoms with my red flannel. We can't miss it. We'll take all the wagons you got and go right across quicksand bottoms and pulling up the stakes as we go. They won't even know what happened to us until it's too late. Once to cross the bottoms. 
It's a straight shoot to Denver. All the flat, open country. We'll be free and clear. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh, yep. Yeah, my sentiments. Exactly. Here's one. Here's another one. And here's one. What are they? I don't know. But does it look familiar? Well, it looks like Mr. John's underwear. It is. Are you... are you sure? The ladies have confirmed it. He's not wearing those underdrawers now. They're torn to shreds and spread out on stakes all across quicksand bottoms. Where's Group C? <whistles> Mrs. Massengale, have you any idea what these stakes are for? I'm not sure, but I know what we're going to do with them. What? Move them. Signal, sir. All wagons ready for the exchange. Platoons A and B in position. Get down there, Buell. Send Mrs. Massingale over to the exchange point. Yes, sir. Mrs. Massingale. Oh, oh, oh. Mrs. Massingale, excuse me, ma'am. I'm very busy right now, Mr. O'Flaherty. But it's about them ten wagons, ma'am. Well, what's the matter with them? Nothing, ma'am, but well, they ain't whiskey. Ain't whiskey? No, ma'am. Those wagons is filled with French champagne. All of them. You know anything about French champagne, Mum? Well, I sipped some once in my second honeymoon in Paris. Aye, but it was most likely cold. These bottles ain't. They're warm. And if you've ever opened a bottle of warm champagne, especially when it's been shooken up, well, it's, uh, whoosh. You mean they explode? Like a regular marsh gun, about a 58 caliber. Oh, we gotta handle those bottles like dynamite, your ladyship. That's why they hired us Irish Teamsters. It's our business. But what's going to happen when them savages get a hold of them wagons? What's going to happen to that champagne? Explosions? Right. Just thought someone ought to know. Have you told Colonel Gerhardt about this yet? Oh, no, ma'am. I've been afeard to. What's holding up, Mrs. Massengale? They're ready for you. Oh, I I'm sorry, Sergeant Buell. Excuse me, Mr. O'Flaherty. Massengale, we have a bit of a problem. Chief Five Barrels insists on taking the first wagon, and his brother-in-law the second wagon, and his second brother-in-law the third wagon, and Elk's Runner the fourth wagon. Now, that doesn't leave anybody in charge on their side. Me in charge. You? You, you, you speak our tongue? Mm, I speak with straight tongue. Me in charge, good. Drink later. All right. We'll agree to your taking charge on one condition, that I stay at the exchange point the whole time. Me, there, whole time. Good. One moment, please, Captain. Oh, Mrs. Massengale, I'll never forgive myself for having failed you. Ten wagon loads of whiskey to the Indians. I've destroyed the crusade. Not quite yet. What? Give me a hat pin. Hat pin? Our goal is still in sight, Louise. Courage, ladies! First three ladies, uh, front and center. There they go, sir. Three women starting across. Sir? Sir? The commander. That Massengale woman again, she's heading to the exchange point. What's that damn fool symbol of good faith doing with her? I can't say, sir. Roll the first wagon. First wagon! Roll! to 
do bolting out of there like that. Roll wagon two. Wagon two! Oh! Ladies, move out! Wagon two! Roll! Tell them not to bolt out of there like that. Our teams are getting out of control. Tell those Indians not to bolt out of there like that!
My tongue? I speak with straight tongue. We go home, hunt buffalo. Peaceful Indian, forget presents. You hunt buffalo in peace. You hunt deer of green forest in peace. You go home in peace. But go home! Companies A and B of the cavalry escorted the ex-temperance marchers back to their husbands and hungry children at Fort Russell. It is to be assumed some time passed before the Indians were able to regain their customary composure. But it is known that the exploits of their journey became tribal legend to be told over and over again from generation to generation with slight revisions. The Denver Free Militia dissolved, never to march again. And of course, the strike of the Irish Teamsters failed. And the Wallingham Freighting Company went bankrupt, having no visible assets. You know, Frank, uh, some engines told me once, uh, uh, reliable engines, Frank. They said a Cheyenne Brave and his pony sunk right here. And darn if they didn't ooze up again. They're just as natural looking and as pretty as you please. Oh, they was dead, of course. But right near the top where you could grab easy. <laughs> it might be worth waiting for, right here. Frank? Frank? <laughs> uh, see? <laughs> uh. So ended the great disaster at Quicksand Bottoms. Oh, yes, Mrs. Massingale. Cora Templeton Massingale retired from all active participation in temperance movements. A military wedding was held at Fort Russell. As it turned out, it was a double wedding. A 
homestead claim was filed by Mr. Jones and Mr. Wallingham on a piece of land encompassing the entire Quicksand Bottoms area. to be denied that there were occasional re-emergences of whiskey kegs, which kept Mr. Jones and Mr. Wallingham, uh, uh, quite content for a number of years. And in spite of all predictions, shaggy hair and busy beavers to the contrary, the winter of 1867 turned out to be the driest and warmest on record. Such was the year, O oh, pioneer West and the days of the Hallelujah Trail. Don't know where we're going or where we've been. Hallelujah Trail. It's written in the dust and blown by the wind. Hallelujah Trail. You can't tell a horse from a stubborn mule. Hallelujah Trail. You can't tell the hero from a dog on fool. Hallelujah Trail. We're on our way. 